After leaving the apartment, we headed towards the Garches Hospital complex, and the rain, which had stopped falling for several hours, resumed even harder. On the highway, the anthracite gray vehicle in which we find ourselves cuts through the curtain of water at a brisk pace to the tune of Motorhead's Ace of Spades. The windshield wipers beat frantically, trying to clear the water crashing forcefully against the glass. It's raining so heavily that the headlights struggle to properly illuminate the asphalt road, which now resembles a strange ink mirror. During the journey, I couldn't resist and started singing like a fool to the various songs we listened to, which elicited some much-needed laughter from us. Not that I sing badly or off-key, but I do it in a very comedic way with a big smile on my face. Jean is driving so fast that it takes us less than an hour to reach our destination. However, the more time passes, the more hungry I feel. In my stomach, I'm starting to feel the very first cramps that accompany long periods of abstinence, and unfortunately for me, I can sense that I haven't reached the end of my troubles yet. Upon our arrival at the premises, we are quickly greeted by a rather old man in apple green protective clothing, who upon seeing me, displays a most circumspect expression. He didn't seem at all to expect my presence, let alone to see such a different girl arrive both in appearance and in the way she is dressed. In short, I have the look of the perfect little soft goth albino, without excess and without bad taste. Glasses and thick leather jacket, tank top and cargo pants, rangers on my feet, all in black and adorned with several strategically placed steel piercings. But unlike what I would have liked, I don't have any tattoos. My body, my immune system rejects the inks like any foreign substance. But strangely, it still manages to tolerate piercings without any rejection. Honestly, I'll never understand our strange biology. Still struggling painfully against my ravenous hunger, to make matters worse, it's once I've arrived in the corridor, leading to the room where the victim awaiting autopsy is stored, that the smell of antiseptic products and other solvents used to maintain the premises gives me a slight onset of nausea. For my very sensitive sense of smell, this mixture of odors is most unpleasant to endure. And I have to resign myself to breathing slowly through my mouth to reduce the discomfort as much as possible. Despite all my efforts, I still distinctly perceive a chemical aftertaste in the air around me. But the worst part is the scent of the much desired blood that I can't ignore, and which continues to emanate from the room where the victim's body lies, stretched out on the study table behind the glass window. Jean steps forward and shakes hands with the old doctor to greet him. Good evening, Sarge. Let me introduce you to Lara Keeble. She's here to assist me on our case, he says, gesturing towards me. Although I've spent many years at various crime scenes and witnessed numerous autopsies during my career as a cop, strangely, this is the first time I've met him. I give him a slight wave to greet him. Hello, Mrs. Lara. So now, Jean, you're bringing in outsiders for your investigations? Sarge has the air of those old doctors close to retirement that one can occasionally see in the police series aired on television. Tall and thin, small round glasses perched on his nose, graying hair, and advanced baldness. Honestly, I don't have a choice anymore. We're going in circles, and the victims keep piling up. And how can she be of use to us? It's complicated to explain. I don't doubt your judgment, Jean. If you say she can help us take this guy down, then so be it. Mrs. Lara, have you ever attended an autopsy? Yes, I'm not afraid of the sight of blood, if that's the question. I worked as a commander alongside him at the SRPJ de Versailles for several years. Oh, I see, he replies simply. I silently observe the female body covered by a simple veil, lying behind the glass under the powerful spotlights, bathing her in their cold white light. Their glare is so intense that despite my dark glasses, the light they emit manages to irritate my retinas. On the glass, I see Serge's reflection. He raises his graying eyebrows in surprise following this disconcerting statement. But madam, if you'll pardon me, looking at you, I find it hard to imagine you were in law enforcement. My gaze returns to Serge once again. It's all right. Many people have told me the same thing in the past when I was still in service. And to be honest, I've unfortunately gotten used to it. Well then, let's begin. Before entering the autopsy room, he invites us to put on protective gear. Unfortunately for me, there isn't a single suit in my size, and I have to make do with one that's twice too big, 
making me look ridiculously small. Entering the refrigerated room, Serge removes the shroud covering the body, and I see the naked corpse of the young girl, or what's left of it. Once again, the tabloids were right. A journalist had probably greased the palms of a slightly corrupt cop to get his information. Money can make people talk, especially when you're offering sums with several zeros. I was told once that almost anything can be bought. You just have to pay the price. Or hold a knife to someone's throat. Mine tightens at the sight of the young body. I shouldn't think this, but the corpse of this young girl is far from the first I've seen during my long life, and it surely won't be the last. Over the past hundred years, they were generally the result of wars I witnessed, various domestic and road accidents, or murders I worked on during my time at the SRPJ. Yes, I've seen my fair share of corpses over more than a century, quantities that could drive you mad. Some were more or less damaged, while others were in various stages of advanced decay. But in all my life, I have never seen anything like this. I have never witnessed such deliberate mutilation inflicted upon a person, and I already know that this repugnant image will never leave my already burdened mind. I probably repeat myself, but even I, who can brutally kill my opponents, have never had any unhealthy urges that would lead me to intentionally mutilate them, either before or after their death. It's in moments like these that I wish I could become human again. So I could, with proper therapy and some medication, manage to forget all this horror spread out before me. Gene, on the other hand, struggles to suppress an expression of disgust that shows on his face. Even after all these years of dealing with difficult scenes, he still suffers just as much from seeing the lives of such young people cut short by absurdity. At this very moment, just like me, he must be thinking exactly the same thing. But what kind of sick individual could do such a thing? I take my place against the wall, arms crossed over my aching stomach. Gene stands a few steps away from me, his arms also crossed, resting on his chest. In front of us, the coroner begins his laborious work, verbally noting every detail, every element of the procedure, using an outdated old dictaphone. I don't understand how one can bear to do such work. Being around the dead is one thing, but dissecting them is another. And the more time passes, the worse I feel. Even though I would prefer warm, fresh blood, the scent of the delicious blood still lingering in the corpse taunts me. So close and yet so inaccessible. It tortures me. At this rate, if I don't feed, I'll go mad. I need blood and quickly. I could try to steal a blood bag meant for transfusions, but the risk of being caught is very high. And besides, it lacks a certain vitality. As if life force were something real. But lacking a better explanation, I have none. I can manage with it, of course, but it's less nourishing and less flavorful. In the current situation, I need something really fresh. I need a victim and a moment alone with them. In my stomach, it feels like two nasty horned gremlins are bickering, taking malicious pleasure in lacerating my entrails. But despite this, I strive to maintain a serene attitude in front of them as much as possible. Unfortunately, despite my long experience, I don't seem to have become the perfect actress I thought I was. And Serge doesn't fail to notice that something isn't right with me. Are you feeling okay, miss? Lara, are you okay? You've been holding your stomach for a while now. I'm fine. I'll be okay. Just some nasty cramps. It's just that, you know, my condition. I need to take a break. Get out of here. The smell of... I grimace in pain. The smell is starting to bother me. Why didn't you tell me before coming? How long has it been since you had any blood? What? Sarge furrows his brow. At least a week. Oh God, Lara, don't mess around with your health. Jean pinches the bridge of his nose between his thumb and index finger, restraining himself from uttering another favorite curse word he often uses to punctuate his sentences. All right, can we take a break, Sarge? I just need some fresh air, that's all. I pause. And probably a smoke or two. Yes, we can take a short break for a few minutes. The dead have all the time in the world now. With those words, I quickly leave the autopsy room and remove my protective gear before heading towards the nearest exit. It's unthinkable for me to feed here without drawing attention. Crossing the corridors, I quickly arrive in the hospital wing where the emergency room is located. Passing by the patients waiting to be attended to, I stop in the middle of the hallway completely frozen by the intense smell of blood. Fresh, warm blood. 
Slowly, I turn my head towards a man on my right. My field of vision narrows like a tunnel, and all I see is that I am completely absorbed, hypnotized by the gash on his head. By the compress soaked in red that he presses against the wound with one hand to stop the continuous oozing. Time seems to slow down, almost coming to a halt. The sounds become distant echoes, and without realizing it, I run my tongue over my fangs. I salivate as if I can smell the delicious scent of a well-roasted chicken in the midst of cooking, warm, golden, and perfectly crispy. Madam? A soft, warm thing lands on my left shoulder. A hand. Miss? The female voice insists. I abruptly snap out of my trance and realize it's a nurse in her uniform speaking to me with a hint of concern in her voice. Ma'am, are you okay? Um, yes, sorry. I was just lost in thought. Are you really sure you're okay? She insists. Yes, I assure you. You seemed... She studies me skeptically. That's kind of you, but don't worry. I just need some fresh air. I came with Commander Duval, and I just came out of the autopsy room. The smell of antiseptics made me nauseous. Oh, I understand it must not be easy to witness such a thing. No, indeed. Miss, listen, if you're not feeling well, don't hesitate. That's what we're here for. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Have a good evening. Before leaving, I bid her goodbye with a smile. Thank you. The nurse goes back to her side, attending to her patients, and I do the same. I quickly leave the waiting hall. I know I narrowly avoided an accident, and deep down, I feel that my recklessness will cost me, because to satisfy my current hunger, I would need to drain a person until their death, something I obviously cannot do, something I don't want to do. So tonight, I'll have to find a prey. Feed enough on them to quench my ravenous thirst and hold out for just one more day. Furthermore, I know that in the event of a serious accident, this won't be enough, and the consequences could quickly become catastrophic. Once I'm outside the hospital, I sit on the nearest public bench, my hand trembling from withdrawal. I reach for my pack of Marlboros in the inner pocket of my leather jacket, take out a cigarette, light it, and take a few salvational puffs. It's utterly ridiculous, I have to admit. Since my body is immune to all existing chemicals, poisons, and even nicotine, the effects are almost non-existent on me. Depending on their respective toxicity, their harmful effects last only a few moments or minutes for me, just long enough until they are eliminated. This means I can neither truly get drunk nor really get high, at least not for more than a minute or two. The best part of it all is that I'm not at risk of dying from any cancer or human diseases. My immune system is a truly impregnable fortress. In truth, it's just the smell of warm tobacco that I enjoy, or perhaps the gesture. I don't know, maybe both. It's just that for a moment, it helps me focus on something else. I must look like a junkie craving her fix. After a while, Gene and Serge also come out of the hospital and join me. With his hands in the pockets of his trench coat, my concerned friend asks, feeling better? I exhale a small cloud of smoke towards the sky. I've seen worse. It was probably the chemicals that made me sick. But once I've had something to eat, I'll probably feel better. In truth, I feel really unwell, but I continue to appear as calm as possible in front of them, not letting my true state show. I give them a smile that reveals my little fangs, which Serge notices with surprise, but he doesn't comment on it. If you say so, would you like us to go get you something while you recover a bit? Jean asks. Yes, that would be kind. It'll probably help me hold out a bit longer. Serge, will you come with me? The old doctor observes me for a moment, thoughtful, before responding, yes, why not? I know I shouldn't accept such a thing, but I really need these few minutes to be alone, as it has become urgent for me to find a real meal. As soon as they are far enough away, I stub out the remainder of my cigarette on the ground, then toss the butt into a nearby trash can on my way. Without wasting a moment, I head towards the visitor parking lot, where I easily spot a lone man who gives me the distinct impression that he's about to leave as soon as he finishes his smoke, just like me. With a keen eye, I make sure there's absolutely no one else around, and to save time, I cover much of the distance towards him by running, much faster than any overtrained Olympic champion. To any observers looking my way, they would only see a blurry figure moving in the beam of the public lights. Once I'm just a few meters away from him, I freeze in silence, listening carefully to make sure there really is no one else nearby. I'm alone with him, 
and that's perfect. Now, I need to act quickly before getting caught in this delicate situation with him. I take one last look around, pull the hood of my sweater over my head to hide my hair, and I dart towards my prey. So, like a moving shadow, I skillfully slip up behind him, silent and discreet. I take all these precautions so that he won't recognize me if his memory returns later. Generally, very few of my victims remember this privileged moment we share. Silly me. Just before grabbing him, I realize I'm faced with a rather trivial problem. The guy is two heads taller than me. First, I have to kick him behind the knee to make him lose his balance. The effect is immediate. In no time, he's brought down to my height, and without further ado, I grab him before he fully realizes what just happened. Second, I need him to lose consciousness. To do this, I place a hand on his neck and press hard enough on his carotid artery to cut off his blood flow. In less than a minute, he'll faint. And I clamp my other free hand over his mouth to prevent him from calling for help. Against all expectations, he grumbles and stands back up, lifting me off the ground. He carries my 50-odd kilos without flinching. This guy is really strong. He struggles furiously, contorting himself to try to make me fall. He puts all his energy into defending himself and trying to get rid of me. Fortunately for me, my strength is relentless, and as long as I don't push my body to its maximum, I am absolutely tireless. He lands several furious elbow strikes to my ribs to force me to let go. He writhes, trying to crush me against the car. It produces a dull sound of metal. I hold on. My constitution makes me frightfully resilient. Each of his attempts ends in failure. I'm not used to being so brutal with my victims, but here, I don't have the luxury of hesitating. I really only have a few minutes to feed before they come back. Normally. Shh. It will be fine. You won't feel a thing. Sleep, my little one, I whisper softly to him. After several long seconds of his fierce struggle, the pressure I exert on his neck finally makes him lose consciousness. And suddenly, I think of that obscure quote from an old American book, a little pinch and then sweet. With the nail of my thumb, I slit his carotid artery and I bring my lips to his neck, allowing his delicious warm blood to flow into my mouth. As counterintuitive as it may seem, my small inhuman fangs are not really very useful for feeding me because although they are sharp enough, they are not nearly long enough to be fully effective. I tried once or twice in the past, but the result was rather inconclusive. A good blade or my nails are generally sufficient for me to achieve this without any difficulties. And frankly, even if I can bite my victim with them, I can't see myself cleanly opening an artery with just one bite. Moreover, it is completely ridiculous to think that two such small holes, so shallow, would be enough to quickly drain enough blood without having to spend an eternity. What a sweet sensation. It has been far too long since I abstained. And for a few seconds, I feel my mind starting to wander, losing sight of the well-being of my victim. Quickly, I regain my composure. And despite the intense thirst, I only drink what is absolutely necessary. I absolutely refuse to kill this person, and I do not want to leave victims behind, especially when they have done nothing to me. Once I have finished my little snack, I bite the tip of my tongue with one of my fangs, and I let a few drops of my own blood fall onto his wound, soaking his flesh, and in just a few moments it closes. Thus, the marks of my misdeed disappear as if by magic. Our potent lifeblood possesses this magnificent property of regenerating all kinds of wounds, regardless of the creature receiving it, mortal or immortal, and in no time at all. With these few drops, there is no risk of him becoming a vampire. Only a significant transfusion of my blood into his organism can change that. It must invade his system sufficiently to take over, as his immune system will fight against it as if it were a deadly disease. But for anything in the world, I would not make another vampire. I made a vow to never do so. Moreover, a world in which our species proliferated would be doomed to disappear in the medium term. In a few minutes, he will wake up with a good headache and will only have a vague memory of what really happened that night. And few remember. However, for my part, I am just satisfied with what I have just consumed. I sigh, as a few more centiliters would not have been unwelcome. Before leaving, I place him on the back seat of his car and make sure he is safe. Then, before heading towards the bench where I was supposed to be when they returned, I quickly check one last time that I do not have traces of my last meal on my face. 
Oh, there you are. Where have you been? You've been gone for several minutes. Damn it. Damn, I took longer than expected. Sorry, I just went for a little stroll over there, I tell them, pointing in the opposite direction from where I just came. Well, I couldn't find anything better than this. The cafeteria is closed at this hour. He hands me a simple chicken mayonnaise and vegetable sandwich, the kind you'd find in any train station vending machine. Thank you. This will do. I smile at him. Miss, I'm sorry, Sarge intervenes. May I borrow your friend? I would like to speak with him alone, if you don't mind, of course. Yes. Laura, you'll excuse us. No problem. I'll take the opportunity to eat a bit. They walk a few meters away, hoping to be out of earshot. But for me, even at this distance, they remain perfectly audible. While discreetly listening to them, I unwrap the plastic packaging and take one of the small triangles of sandwich bread. It's not a particularly exciting meal, but it does the job. However, it's still far from matching the taste of fresh, warm blood. Contrary to legend, I don't exclusively feed on human blood, and even though my organism is no longer what it once was, it still has the same needs as before my transformation. But if necessary, I can go for long periods without ingesting anything. Like when Sibile and I once crossed the vast Sahara Desert on foot. On the other hand, the delicious vermilion liquid is simply indispensable to me. If I don't drink it regularly, my strength, speed, and ability to regenerate my wounds quickly begin to decline. Plus, I quickly feel a range of unpleasant sensations intensify. But if I have no other choice, and I'm forced to, I can always feed on animal blood. However, compared to human blood, it tastes bland and flavorless. Moreover, it is far from fully satisfying my physiological needs. And every time it happens, I rarely feel satiated and always a little weaker, more tired. It's in these moments that my body reminds me at every instant of the reality of the situation. I am no longer human, and there is absolutely no going back. Actually, I wouldn't want to go back for anything in the world. Honestly, I don't know if I can survive without human blood, and I really don't want to try to test such a hypothesis. And who would want to anyway? In fact, only human blood fully satisfies my organism. Anyway, I have to keep up the charade, not appear abnormal. Just pretend to be a simple human. I sigh, then take a bite of the sandwich. This sandwich is really not good. Tell me, what did she tell you about her illness? Gene crosses his arms over his chest, the leather creaking. Well, that it's some sort of rare genetic disorder, a kind of atypical porphyria from what she told me, and she needs blood from time to time. That's all I know about it. Blood, are you serious? Is that really what she told you? And you believe her? What do you want me to say? I'm not a doctor. I'm a cop. Listen to me. I've never heard of any illness treated by drinking blood. She's albino, that I'm sure of. But as far as she's concerned, her problem seems to me more like some kind of advanced psychosis than anything else. And our killer, you know what he takes from his victims. I've known her long enough to tell you that on this point she's clean. She's a good girl. Sure, she's a bit weird. I'll give you that. And she does have this vampire fetish, but, but maybe she's gone much further this time. Maybe she's the one behind our murders. Listen, it doesn't really fit with the latest information we've got. We'd be looking for a guy instead. Besides, she used to be a cop with us. Do I need to remind you? Plus, for safety, she's still under my surveillance. I'd like to believe you, Jean. But in my opinion, my gut tells me she's hiding something important about herself. She's probably in cahoots with your main suspect. It's possible. That's why she's under my surveillance. But for now, she might also be our only hope in this sordid affair. For the time being, we need to finish this damn autopsy. Hopefully, it'll help us move forward a bit. Once their private conversation is over, they come back to me. As I suspected, Gene doesn't fully trust me. He's wary of me. The explanation I provided him at the apartment wasn't well received. I can't blame him given the current circumstances. If I were in his place, I would have done the same. Lara, if you're feeling better, can we resume the autopsy? Jean asks me. Yes, I'm feeling much better now. The autopsy, which lasted several hours, didn't yield any actionable information. What we were certain of, however, is that the victim hadn't been raped, as one might expect, but she had clearly been devoured, likely while still alive. For this last point, it was difficult for us to know for certain. Nonetheless, a large portion of her blood was missing, like all the victims before her. 
With Jean's help, I was able to access the victim's files and consult the autopsy reports. One thing in particular caught my attention. It may have been insignificant given their condition, but according to one of the reports, one of them, unlike the others, had her heart violently extracted from her chest without the use of any blade. It was as if our suspect had done it with his bare hands. Why would he take the heart? In short, tonight's autopsy was a dead end. Just before leaving, the results of the samples taken from Little Anne reached us, and upon reading the results, no one understood anything anymore. The saliva samples showed, as always, that the DNA of our suspect was so fragmented that it could belong to either a human or a goat. Could it be that a vampire is behind all this? A few years ago, when I worked in a medical analysis laboratory in Seaside, Oregon, I tried several times to analyze my own blood to see what it might look like. But each time, no matter what I did to try to slow down the process, the samples I collected degraded extremely quickly, far too quickly to be studied. And before I could obtain any results, there was ultimately only a kind of soup composed of pieces of unusable DNA strands, just like that of our suspect.